Hi, this is Tony Sobosinski, and uh, the title for this message is From Generation to Generation. We'll be looking at the two letters to Timothy from the Apostle Paul, 1st and 2nd Timothy. And uh, this is uh, on the church calendar, at least within Lutheran Church and different denominations, mainline denominations. Uh, there's a, a date in January where we celebrate the, the life of and the ministry of Timothy. And it's called St. Timothy, Pastor and Confessor. So that's kind of the inspiration to get into this study. And from generation to generation uh, is God's plan on not only the survival of the church, but the growth of the church and the kingdom of God through the proclamation of the gospel and the proclamation of the word of God. And this is a verse, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, that kind of encapsulizes uh, this thought. Paul says to Timothy, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. There, so there's a, a learning, a winning of people to the, to the Lord, and then entrusting the teachings to them because all of us well, one way to look at it is we have a limited shelf life. None of us lives forever. So we have to have replacements. So who was Timothy? Well, he's mentioned many times in the Bible. And in Acts chapter 16 says he was a disciple. And the word disciple means uh, a student, a follower. Uh, so a disciple of Jesus was, his disciples followed him, worked with him. A, a disciple of Jesus after Jesus ascended into heaven was someone who was mentored, Timothy specifically, under uh, under the apostle Paul and, and others. And uh, it says that he was a son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. In other words, a believer in Jesus. A Jewish, his mom was Jewish. A believer in Jesus but his father was a Greek uh, so a mixed hybrid marriage in biblical terms the Jewish people Israel were the chosen nation and the chosen people of God and Greeks very often was a, a word that was applied to what we call Gentiles uh, also which means non-Jewish people but God's plan was always he loved the whole world and he wanted the Jewish people in Israel to get this message out from generation to generation to the entire world. And Timothy was kind of like a picture of what was happening. He, he was kind of the physical embodiment of Ephesians 2. Uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, I don't want to say bragged, but he held on very dearly and was thankful to the Lord that he was called to be a, a, an apostle or a, a missionary uh, to, the, to the nations, the nations outside of Israel. And he writes this in, in Ephesians chapter 2. This was the letter to the Ephesians. Remember, an epistle is just an old-fashioned English word uh, for letter. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles, in other words, non-Jewish people, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. That's how they used to be, and there's a before and after. Now they are not separated. The ones who have come to faith are now united with Christ, no longer alienated from the commonwealth nation of Israel, but now united with Israel. And no longer strangers to the covenants of promise, like this is a strange religion, but now this is, they have the promise in their lives, and now they have hope, and they have God in the world. And Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 2, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, 
have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And that's the, the, the crucifixion and the, the, uh, of Jesus Christ, where he gave his blood, he died uh, for the sins of the whole world. And now people, Jewish and non-Jewish, Greek and Jew, all were starting to come to believe in Jesus and be part of this body of Christ, is what the Bible talks about. Uh, uh, for he himself, that is Jesus, he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. If you want inclusive, in, to be inclusive, and, and you want to have unity, it's through God. There, There is a a part of Christianity that I'm afraid is going to be very offensive more and more uh, to the thoughts and, and the, the thought police of our world now. And that is Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In the book of Acts, it says, there is no other name under heaven by which someone can be saved. So there is one truth. There is one true religion. There is one true God, and there is one Savior. But when we come to him and we have faith in him, all the barriers come down and, and we're made one together, brought together in unity. And this includes, it, it's inclusive of every race, tribe, every people. So he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man. And that's kind of what was the physical embodiment of Timothy in his own DNA. He was Greek from his father, Jewish through his mother, and symbolizing what the whole world would be reunited with the people of God, with Israel, with Jesus, the King of the Jews. And Timothy is mentioned several times in the book of Acts, traveling on missionary trips. He's mentioned in the book of Romans. He's mentioned in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. He's mentioned in the book of Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Philemon, and Hebrews. And he has two epistles or letters in the Bible written to him, 1st and 2nd Timothy, from the Apostle Paul. And Apostle Paul is knowing that he needs to disciple or mentor or help train someone to be his replacement, many replacements, because one day he will no longer be there. And he has to preach the gospel and, and uh, train those to do the same. Paul also very affectionately refers to Timothy. He says, he refers to him as my true son in the faith. It's not that Paul was actually his father physically, but he was a son in the faith because Timothy responded to the gospel and he considered him part of his own, like a son to him. He calls him my beloved son. And it's also Timothy is referred to as an evangelist. Now an evangelist is someone uh, who has the gift of evangelism, usually, it seems, and does the work of evangelism, which means proclaiming the gospel. That's the, the, the just the simple gospel, uh, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation for all who will believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, the Greek. So an evangelist is someone who's a special calling and power from God to be able to proclaim this good news of Jesus, that Jesus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish because Jesus came to die on the cross to pay our penalty for our sins. He rose from the dead and he gave the promise that anyone who believes in him would have forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. This is the proclamation of an evangelist. And whenever, if we were to run out of evangelists and evangelism in the church, the shelf life for the entire congregation and the entire church on earth is just one generation away from extinction. 
Now here are a couple of interesting verses. First Timothy 1, 18 says, This command I entrusted to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you. So in, in the church at that time, people would prophesy over someone, and they did, and they prophesied about Timothy. And he would take these prophecies as assurances in direction of, of what he used to be doing in his life. Chapter 4, verse 14 goes on again to say, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was granted to you through words of prophecy, with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. So what this spiritual gift is, it's not defined, but he is, he is told by Paul, remember that you have been called to do the work of an evangelism. So perhaps that spiritual gift that was granted him was the gift of evangelism, which uh, give, would give him a passion for reaching out to the lost and to the saved with uh, the reminder and the new, good news to the lost who had never heard that Jesus loves them. And they can have eternal life and be part of his kingdom and have a new start and a new life. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Paul says, Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. But he was also a theologian, a teacher, a pastor, and an administrator. And what I mean by a theologian is that he studied God's word in and out. He was trained and, 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 and listened and learned under the Apostle Paul. And he became an expert in knowing the study of God through the word of God through the Bible. And he was also a teacher, even though he's an evangelist, he, he was a teacher of those who had been evangelized. He was a pastor. He was actually a pastor to pastors, too. And he was an administrator because God, or the Apostle Paul, uh, w w told him that he needed to organize the churches and he'd need to appoint, they needed to appoint leaders, deacons and, and elders. And he shows them how to do that. And he says, this is the work you need to be doing, too. And this is about the Great Commission that Jesus uh, 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 preached. This is after he rose from the dead, his last words in the book of Matthew. He says, go therefore and make disciples. Remember, those are students, uh, followers, and people who will live their lives for Jesus. Of all nations, the whole world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And this is referring to that, the very beginning when the gospel takes uh, uh, root and people uh, have saving faith. And then not stopping there, but teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So all the teachings of Jesus and, and all the teachings of the Word of God, uh, we are to, to train, to be trained in order to have this great commission of bringing the gospel to all the world. So the great commission is from generation to generation, the apostle Paul and to the younger man, Timothy, and the Timothy then to many others who would be able to entrust others. We all have a shelf life and we all need replacements. We need to reach the lost as congregations as part of the body of Christ and if we don't care about the lost well I don't even want to go there but that's very bad so we need to train teach and equip people to use their spiritual gifts find out what part they have in the body of Christ and to reproduce themselves spiritually by getting the gospel out we need to contribute to the growth of the kingdom now, unfortunately, we as the church and as individual have not always been faithful to our calling. I just found this picture on the, on, on the internet. It says, will the last person leaving Seattle turn out the lights? And I, I don't really know what that's all about. I, I'm aware that there were all kinds of rioting and looting and horrible things that happened in Seattle. 
maybe that's what they're talking about. People are leaving Seattle because they don't trust they have a police department or a government that cares about them. I don't know. Maybe they had their businesses burned down. But it just reminded me that if a generation stops proclaiming the gospel of Christ and passing it on, there will be the point when we're the last person left. So will the last person turn out the lights. Now this I know is, well, it's reality. I don't know how things are going in non-denominational churches, but I haven't heard really great things over there either. But in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod is the denomination I felt led by the Lord to serve most of my years of ministry and of which holds to the Bible as the authoritative word of God. And uh, that's why I am with this organization and serving in, in local congregations uh, for many, many years now. If you look at the first graph, you see there's a chart with child baptisms in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. It started in 1947, remember that was just after uh, the end of World War II. And people came home and there was a time of peace and what we called the baby boomers were started be, uh, being born because soldiers came home, they got married, they started raising families and people went to church back then. I was born in 1953, that's when I was baptized near the top. And by 1960, uh, that was the very top, uh, the peak of the, 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 the many, many children and, and the popularity, if you will, with the church. There's very few people didn't go to some kind of Christian church in those days. But then you see there's a decline. It just starts going downhill through each decade until we come to the point now where unfortunately there are churches without any Sunday schools at all. There's no more children. There are churches without any youth group because there are no more youth. And the graph on the right shows declining graphs of all of these different mainline Protestant churches. Uh, it's something that's been going on, not just in the Missouri Synod, but 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 across uh, the the main denominations that used to be in effect for w when I was a kid. So if you're the last one out, please turn out the lights. It's not a good mission for the church. But here it shows a church with a for sale sign. And as I served as a circuit counselor uh, and was able to speak to our district president, I was shocked to find out how many churches were closing their doors and dissolving. They would have the final last meeting. There weren't enough people left to keep the church going. They would have the last service, put a for sale sign out and the church building would be sold. We all age and one day it could happen across the kingdom of God if, if, if we don't change. And that's the hope that has from generation to generation we need. It is a necessity that we care about the next generation, our own children, our own grandchildren, as much as we do about ourselves. We cannot just be concerned about what we like. We have to be concerned and how we reach the next generation for Jesus. We need to pass it on, not just grasp it and hold it to ourselves and say, well, I'm going to heaven and I don't care about anyone else, not even my own children. So again, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these to faithful people will also be able to teach others also from generation to generation. There's still hope if we get the gospel out to the world. But where the gospel is not taken out, the society becomes 
anti-Christian. Now, one of the ways we can pass on uh, the, 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 our story uh, from generation is to tell our story, our testimony of what Jesus means for me. And, and that doesn't have to be a, a, a time when you were a horrible sinner and you became a Christian, but it can be present. What does Jesus mean to you now? Do you love him? Do you have communion with him? Do you pray and do you find the benefits of a believer? You need to consider writing down your own story so that you can tell someone when the opportunity arrives. And that's what the Apostle Paul does in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, even though, and he's speaking of himself now, he was a Pharisee trained. He says, even though I was previously a blasphemer because he was very religious, but he hated Jesus and all of the followers. He said, I was previously a blasphemer and a persecutor. He not only hated Christians, he went after them to make, and he says even a violent aggressor. One of the things in the book of Acts is he was standing and holding the cloaks of those who were stoning Stephen to death. So Paul did have a very big before and after story. He says, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. He's saying, even though I was this religiously trained and by some of the best scholars, I was ignorant. I was stupid spiritually. I was an unbeliever, even though I was so religious. I remember once in, uh, I was told this story way back in some of the beginnings of my ministry. We, uh, uh, well, I won't even tell you what country or <laughs> where it was. But what had happened is uh, there was a pastor in this town uh, who had written columns or newspaper, and he, he didn't believe in the Bible. And later on, he, after he moved, he sent a letter back to the newspaper that was printed, and he said, even though I was a pastor of a church, he says, I was not a believer. I was ignorant. He said, and he finally come to the point where he came to true saving faith. He was born again and it changed everything. And he made an apology for that to that community for the words he had said and the actions he had said against the Bible when he was an unbelieving, ignorant, religious man, but not saved. The Apostle Paul is kind of saying the same thing. He says, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in, in unbelief. Thank God. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am the foremost and what the Apostle Paul was saying, here's my story. And I was so bad that if Jesus still loves me and saved me, he can save anybody. Think about your story, what you would share about your relationship with God to someone if the opportunity arrives. And we pass on the very word of God. That's what the Bible is. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handing, handling the word of truth. And we're going to look at that whole idea of truth because the devils have been fighting against that for years. But the amplified version, that's what amp means on this slide, says study and do your best to present yourself to God approved. We, we are students as disciples, and especially if we have leadership positions, we are obligated by God to study the Bible from cover to cover, over and over, in depth, to do our best to present ourselves to God approved, a workman tested by trial who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. I like the amplified version for that verse. It really it brings it out. And we're also called to pass it on by being by our example. 
Second uh, Timothy two twenty four, the Lord's bond servant, uh, and and following through twenty six, the Lord's bond servant, in other words, his servant that that we have bonded ourselves together to voluntarily serve him, uh, to be proud to be slaves of the Lord Jesus. The Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, skillful in teaching, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will that's the setting that we are in before we come to Jesus we are in the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will and there is no truth in the devil even Pontius Pilate when questioning Jesus she's uh, Jesus spoke of truth and Pontius Pilate said what is truth it's been the old philosophical question that's gone on through your there is no truth everything's relative your truth is true for you my truth but that's not true there is truth and it is in Jesus he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But by our example, we must be kind, filled with the Spirit of God, as we are not quarrelsome, but we try to win people to a knowledge of the truth so that they can be come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. And the window might be closing. The Bible talks about difficulty in the last days. Second Timothy chapter 3, Paul says, In the last days, difficult times will come. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, slanderers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The love of many will grow cold, Jesus said. So we need to work while there is light and the sun still shining and before that darkness comes. And he goes on to say that they hold a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such people. And what he's talking about is that there can be a form of godliness that we look very religious. There are different churches you can go to and they might look the same. The pastor is either does has a robe on or not. Uh, there, there are different church colors or not, but totally different. There can be some that have actually, like the Apostle Paul, after born again believers who believe in the word of God and all the supernatural power that's connected with God and his word and his promises. Or you can have people who just have a form of godliness, like that one pastor I spoke of, who have denied its power. There are some who don't even believe in the resurrection. They don't even believe, and they call themselves Christian pastors. So what are we to do? Well, the Bible's very clear. Avoid such people. You have to be careful whom you associate. On one thing, we want to be able to witness and share the gospel and the love of Christ with all such people, but not to make them our church home, not to make them the denomination to which we belong. I had a uh, professor, loved the guy, way back uh, in seminary when I was in Asbury Theological Seminary. And uh, I was kind of lost because uh, I'd come from a Nazarene church uh, with my wife. But the Nazarene general superintendent basically came in and said, uh, if you're going to go on with the Nazarene Church, you got to move right now from Asbury Theological Seminary to Nazarene Theological Seminary. 
or your career is done and you've got to find another denomination. Now, the amazing thing was is both seminaries taught the same things. But anyway, so I had to find a denomination. I talked to my advisor and I know he had been in part of a, a denomination. I'm not going to mention any names that way, but this nomination had a combination of people who believed the Bible and a combination of people who didn't. Some pastors believed in the resurrection and the supernatural word of God, and some people just thought they could pick and choose, and they really weren't believers. I remember him sitting down with me because I thought, well, I could serve in the same denomination that he served. And I remember him saying, Tony, the danger is you can pour your heart into a congregation, a local church, and God does things to you. And then the next guy who doesn't even believe the Bible can come over and just tear it all apart. So there's nothing left. So from that time on, I, I decided that I should be seeking a denomination and people, which I could declare and believe that the the Bible is the word of God, the, the authoritative instruction for our faith. It says about these people who have a form of godliness, they look very religious, but they have denied its power. They don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe in the Bible. Avoid these people because, well, not really because, but it describes them a little more. They are always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. There is no truth. Everyone has their own truth, but that's a lie from hell. There is objective truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 through 17 says that all scriptures, that's all the writings of God that have been brought together in the Bible through the Old Testament at this point especially, plus all the books that the Holy Spirit led the church to put together in the New Testament. All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. This is our book. It brings us the message of salvation for our own salvation. This is our book. It, it, it brings the, the message of salvation to those to whom we share this with. And it, it, it's our life book because it shows us the way and, and the, the way we are to become. And it's full of life. So the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, as you pass this on from generation to generation, he says, preach the word. The Bible, the scriptures, the word of God. Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, always, Peter said something similar. He said, uh, always be prepared to, to, to give an answer to those who are asking for the hope that you have within you. Be ready. You have to know the Bible in order that you can gently and lovingly correct, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And he goes on to say, for the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. Doctrine's almost got a, a dirty, become a dirty word with some people. But doctrine is the teaching of the Bible. And sound doctrine is, as opposed to false doctrine, is uh, like proper medicine worth versus poison. Except at least with medicine, you, you die if you take the wrong stuff. But with you've got false doctrine, it kills your soul for eternity if you believe it. Sound doctrine is important, but the time, looking to the end days again, will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They see pastors and evangelists just as their servants. They want to hear the message they want to hear. They want to lead like they're told to lead. So these people wanting to have their ears tickled, this, it's entertainment to them. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. In other words, you can pick and choose, and you can do that now on, on the Internet with all the different videos that are out there. And you can choose what you want to hear. 
you can either choose someone who's true to the Bible and hear what the Bible says, or you can choose someone who says whatever you want to hear according to your own desires. And it says, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to miss. Don't let this happen to you. And Paul knew that he was coming to the last stage of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. If you don't mind using that crude word, shelf life, or phrase, uh, he didn't have much time left. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. Praise God to be able to say this like he did. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So Jesus gives us some advice. How do we, if we need to turn around, how, how, how do we turn around to, to get on track again? Well, in Revelation chapter 2, uh, there's a message from Jesus to the church of Ephesus. Ephesus is a city, and they had a congregation. And Jesus says this, he's evaluating them. I know your deeds and your labor and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. They were very good at getting the false teachers out. And you have put those who call themselves apostles to the test. And they are not. And you have found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured on account of my name and have not become weary. They were very good in having sound theology, sound doctrine, and weeding out the people who were teaching differently. But Jesus says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place. And what does it mean to remove their lampstand from its place? Well, if you read, go back into the first couple chapters of the book of Revelation, you find that represents the church. He's saying, I will remove you as a church, as a congregation, if you don't change. They had sound doctrine. They had a hatred of evil, but they had lost their first love, and this was unacceptable to Jesus. The first love is often thought of as uh, the passion that we have when those of us, like the Apostle Paul, have a change in life, come to know Jesus, and we just love him. And everything we do is out of love for him. We're grieved when we do things that, that uh, would offend him or misrepresent him. And there's uh, a passion in our hearts. So how do you change this? Well, Jesus says, remember from where you have fallen, if, if you have. Maybe your passion for the Lord is stronger now than it's ever been great. Praise the Lord. But if not, he says, you need to change. You need to repent. That's what repent simply means, is to change. And he says, and do the deeds you did at first. He doesn't say you have to feel this way. He doesn't even talk about, he says, do the deeds you did at first. It's almost like, if you will, spiritual behavioralism. Back when I was in college, I I liked behavioralism in psychology because it meant, who cares how you feel? And all these other, you just need to change your behavior to healthy behavior. It almost reminds me of that a little bit here, where it says, do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and I will remove your last one's place. And personally, I look back when I was a first a brand new believer, I worked in an outreach ministry called the Saul Company. And uh, 
we got the gospel out every Friday at a concert and so on. We learned how to share the gospel. So if anyone had a question about Jesus, we could share the gospel with them. And we saw basically about a dozen youth every single weekend, 8 to 12, would come to Jesus and, and come to the first faith they had in their life. And that's exciting and, and exhilarating to be part of that and to be contributing to it and see other people uh, come to salvation. And then uh, it was just a, a year or so two later, we went off to seminary. And at uh, the seminary, I was challenged by pastor of the church in the town of the seminary, because we were living about seven miles away to go from door to door to try to get children who might want to be part of a children's youth ministry. And reluctantly, Penny and I, my wife, we both went door to door and we ended up, God blessed our reluctant efforts and, and uh, they had to buy a van to start driving all these kids into the church seven miles away. And that was wonderful. Uh, the kids we got so close to in that and it went on. We had a, uh, God gave us the opportunity to have a ministry to youth that was even bigger, and and finally to plant a church. So I look at those things, and it was involved in uh, sitting around having a uh, playing guitar and courses and hymns and in living rooms and so on and praying and and studying the Bible. Do the teach you did it first to get your romance, if you will, spiritual romance with the Lord, heated up again. And finally, our last slide here is uh, do the work of an evangelist. Now, I, my understanding of spiritual gifts is not everyone has the gift of evangelism. We have different gifts that we contribute together to do the work of an of evangelism though because that's what the church is about jesus died for the sins of the whole world they can't hear if we don't get the message out they'll never hear if we don't care about them at least as much as we care about our own selves so the church as a whole needs to be doing the work of an evangelism or we'll be the last one out turning out the lights and finally this one here fulfill your ministry you have unique gifts you have a unique calling you have a unique ministry whether it's serving helping teaching and there are many spiritual gifts you need to fulfill your ministry and find out what god wants you to do and as congregations we need to fulfill our ministry or one day we might find the lights are out and the lamp stand has been removed and there is no more light in that place so let us close in prayer father we pray in the name of jesus lord that you will speak to us through all this help us to fight the good fight to to finish our course that you have for us and father we pray that instead of the light of of god being put out in the churches lord that you will reverse this decline and help us to be able to reach out and that your glory will be with us and you will give us passionate first love hearts that care more about others than we care about our even our own selves like you did lord jesus so father we praise you we worship you in jesus name amen